Uh, Jack and I were given the title of built environment. We thought that was uh, perhaps a little ambitious for all of these uh, fairly major events. Uh, so we had to cherry pick uh, a little bit. Uh, so we will not really cover virtually every uh, aspect and every building type the way reconnaissance reports often do, but this is really more of a what did we learn and what can we apply. So uh, even though in California we've done a lot about unreinforced masonry buildings for the rest of the country and even for us there are some uh, lessons I think uh, in those buildings and of course from Chile and New Zealand there was a lot of information about reinforced concrete. Um, I wanted to mention non-structural systems because again uh, it became a very significant economic factor. Um, there were some unique things that happened with precast stairs in the Christchurch uh, buildings. Uh, and for the first time uh, in Japan, we had many, many isolated buildings tested fairly severely. So I wanted to mention that. And then we have a few descriptions on uh, bridges and the effects of the tsunami. So there are uh, many types of URM buildings, but uh, the ones that we're concerned about in California and most of the United States are, is this type where you have an exterior bearing wall uh, with uh, typically wood floors. Uh, you also have confined masonry, uh, infill masonry, all kinds of other URMs that do exist in these uh, locations, but the bearing wall building is, is, the, is where the lessons are, and particularly in New Zealand, the, their buildings are almost identical to ours. Uh, so just a couple of examples from Chile. Uh, a, a, a brick building and expected kind of damage uh, uh, walls near the top uh, fell off and crashed into the in, inside the building another building that's very much like ours you can see the interior and the wood floors and so on uh, collapsed from the exterior wall uh, peeling away we've seen this many times now in uh, the Canterbury earthquake sw swarm, which you've heard about was actually several earthquakes, two primary ones. Um, there was a Royal Commission created by the uh, national government in uh, New Zealand. It's sort of a unique uh, English uh, uh, tradition of, of an investigation, not necessarily to find fault, but to find out what happened. I can't possibly go over all the data that was collected on unreinforced masonry buildings today. So I reference you to this uh, website and these two reports by Professor Jason Ingham. Uh, they looked at virtually every URM building in Christchurch. Uh, so they developed uh, pretty amazing uh, statistics uh, uh, about this kind of building. Now the ground motions uh, in Christchurch have been talked about, but not necessarily maybe related to to uh, code kinds of issues. So this is the elastic spectrum from the September, the first earthquake. Uh, and for comparison here, we have the Christchurch 500 year event, which is sort of their design event. And uh, as you can see, uh, there I have a plotted a couple of other things, sort of a moderate seismic US uh, design basis with a two second spectral acceleration of about 0.5 G and then a very high near field uh, 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 spectrum uh, equivalent to about 1.35 G. So uh, this looked very much like about their design basis earthquake, although if you look at the inelastic spectrum, it's probably in general a little bit lower. And then the September, I mean the fe February event was the uh, spectacular one, you might say. Uh, so th this plot is plotted against uh, the equivalent in uh, New Zealand of their MCE, which they normally consider the 2500 year event. Somehow this arrow got misplaced, but this is the 2500 year event. Uh, again, this, this is the moderate seismic US zone. You can see it far exceeds that, <clears throat> but it's not nearly up to our strongest shaking that we expect uh, in near field. So going back to the September event, uh, we can look at uh, what happened and we can relate it uh, if, if you want to understand uh, in my city, if I don't have uh, very many retrofitted URMs, uh, what kind of damage do I expect for about 
0.2 GPGA. So th that event was about 0.2 GPGA. And what we saw was we've seen before, uh, gables of which there are many in New Zealand uh, in Christchurch uh, were very, very vulnerable. Uh, it's very hard to tie in these walls near the peak of these sharp uh, roofs. Here's another one, almost no damage in the building except virtually every gable uh, came off. Every one of these, of course, created a massive uh, brick fall on the street. And as has been mentioned several times, no one was killed because it was uh, four o'clock in the morning. And unlike Chile, where people may have been in the nightclubs at four o'clock in the morning, uh, there's nobody in the nightclubs in Christchurch. Uh, so here's another, uh, uh, another type of uh, gable failure that in this case crashed down onto the neighboring building. And during the daytime, there clearly would have been someone in this store. And here's an interesting one. Uh, they have some retrofits, and this gable had been tied back, and it uh, worked partially, but very hard when there's no axial load near the top to get any kind of anchorage into anything to hold uh, these bricks in place. We've seen that here many times, particularly if the masonry quality is not very good. But here's another example where a plate was used rather than an individual anchor and it seemed to hold in everything better because the, even in poor quality masonry, it won't, it won't fall apart around an individual washer. So here's another case, and I chose this one because this entire wall fell onto this business which was called Monumental Masons. So the Monumental Masons got a little surprise uh, if they had been there in the middle of the morning. But they probably had a lot of used bricks that they could use for their work. Uh, all kinds of uh, things you would expect, very small things falling off. Uh, this is an outdoor cafe. These things went right through this roof. So again, if there had been somebody there, even a small trim was dangerous. And then you have complete out of plane failures. Uh, this is a typical uh, Christchurch street scene. It was a very historic city. Uh, it had a very uh, strong flavor, anybody who had been there. And between this earthquake and the next one, that's pr pretty much gone. Here you can see a parapet gone, and here's a whole building front gone. So the damage statistics, uh, as I pointed out, they looked at many, many buildings, 595 buildings. This uh, Jason Ingham actually had a, a national grant to study URMs before the earthquake. So he had students all set up, and he set them off in a field, and they had complete access, so they pretty much looked at every building. They just about got finished with that process when a second earthquake hit, so then they had to kind of start over. Um, but basically, in this 0.2 G uh, approximate motion in September, you had 22% of the 595 uh, URMs get red tagged. So that gives you some sort of a fragility point in terms of how vulnerable unretrofitted uh, URMs are. So gables were very vulnerable at this ground level. Some complete parapets failed. Some complete out of plane uh, falls to the street. Interesting, there was little or no in plane distress. You never saw an X crack. That may have been because the walls fell away before they could load the in plane walls. The, the New Zealanders usually when they retrofit, they actually put in a whole new system. They don't really use the in plane walls very much. And again, I've talked about the reason why there's no uh, fatalities. So if we go again to the, to the 2011 event, it's much stronger motion as we've pointed out. So PGA of about 0.5 is what this is equivalent to. So again, you would expect uh, unretrofitted URMs to be severely damaged at this kind of ground motion. And there is a lot of arguments or interest about whether there was cumulative damage, whether some of these buildings uh, were damaged in uh, September, <clears throat> maybe not apparently. And then the uh, February event came along and polished them off. On the other hand, the good news is that there were a uh, hundred or more buildings that had either been demolished because of the damage in September or were red tagged and were vacated. So there was nobody in them. So uh, they actually saved probably a lot of lives because this did happen in the afternoon uh, when there would have been people in all these buildings and there were uh, a considerable number of buildings that were not there anymore. 
So again, uh, here's a complete wall failure. I, I like this picture because I've never seen a wall come out and have the power still on. So I, I, it's an it's a interesting damage photo. Uh, again, gables <coughs> uh, more so, as you can imagine. Uh, and again, gables more so. This particular church uh, is still standing on a prominent corner. All of the masonry has been re uh, removed, so there's just these r massive roofs are just sort of sitting on some posts waiting for someone to figure out what to do with the building. Uh, complete, many complete wall uh, uh, failures, uh, complete uh, rows of buildings with every building having a wall failure, and this is the whole historic uh, nature of Christ Church, which essentially is gone. Uh, and again, another case of this, about as far as you can see, all the fronts uh, came off. And it, as you will see later, about maybe 40 people or so were killed from URM buildings. When you look at these pictures, it, you would think it would be actually way more because it was one o'clock in the afternoon. You would think there would have been more people on the streets. Now this is an interesting cumulative damage shot. <clears throat> Besides the September and Fe February event, there were actually a lot of uh, earthquakes as have been pointed out, 10,000 in all, but there was actually uh, maybe four or five that would be considering damaging, one on Boxing Day and one in June of 2011. So this particular building, uh, the Jason Ingram's people took a picture of uh, in after the September event, maybe to show there was no damage, and this has obviously been retrofitted. You can see all of the anchors there. You can look, see just a little slight cracking uh, at this discontinuity caused by this chimney or something. So then after the February event, much larger event, you can see that the, the, whatever the distress was being caused by that discontinuity created a, a lot more damage and you're starting to see this wall pull away. We always see this kind of corner damage. Um, and so on. And then in the June event, uh, which again most people are unaware of the whole thing fell apart so there clearly is something about cumulative damage as you can imagine it's just like uh, you know an earthquake that's three times as long perhaps uh, so those are interesting uh, photos that that group took and in fact if you want to dig into the data you can probably find many uh, descriptions of what a building looked like in uh, after September and then compare it with what happened in uh, February. So the overall damage levels, uh, that says September, it should say February. Um, the heavy or worst damage states for about 60% of the URM buildings at this level of shaking. Uh, and heavy or worse is, if you look at what the definitions are, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, significant damage. Pro uh, very few of these buildings were were salvaged. <clears throat> so there were some retrofitted URMs, uh, maybe a hundred or so. They didn't really have any triggers other than um, a, a renovation trigger like we have here, but they had no ordinance set in place. It was a relatively low seismic zone, sort of like our Sacramento, so it's not surprising they didn't really have an active uh, program. There were some uh, Improvements done voluntarily, like a parapet anchorage and so on. But overall, it's very hard to look at the statistics because the criteria varied widely. Some of them just had parapets or wall ties, most of which were done very poorly, as I'll show you in a minute. And then some that were done probably triggered, uh, the ones that were triggered from renovation were done much more elaborately than we would do. They have, they were fairly small buildings and they have a complete uh, seismic system, a new seismic system inside in both directions, often a frame, a concrete frame or a steel frame uh, that tied everything together. So th those systematic uh, retrofits in general uh, did pretty well. There's really no time for me to go into all of the subtleties of all of this, but you can see these reports and, and uh, uh, get much more information. Um, there, I did want to mention uh, the wall ties. Uh, this is a detail from FEMA 547, which is a FEMA document that, that talks about uh, the detailing of seismic retrofits, gives a lot of information about typical details. And the, the, the detail for using epoxy, it, first of all, it's recommended you always put a plate on the outside, but if you can't do that for some reason, if you're going to put an epoxy anchor in, it's suggested that it goes at an angle. 
and you use a screen tube and of course you fill the whole thing up uh, with epoxy. Um, and also it warns about using dowels near openings or at the top of the wall because uh, particularly if brick is of poor quality, it tends to fall apart, especially when there's no gravity load on it. So, so uh, anchors near the top of walls at parapets always have to be looked at very carefully because there's very little gravity load. And there were many, many failures uh, uh, of attempts to strengthen these wall connections near the top, but you can see the, there's about three inches of epoxy near the end of the bolt, very poor uh, uh, way, of, way of doing it. And here's a, you can see how close they were together, uh, but again, just a little bit of epoxy at the end and some bricks still stuck on there, which indicates <clears throat> that the quality of masonry was poor and the wall just pulled away. Uh, so this, this particular uh, situation probably needed a plate maybe on the outside in order to hold that wall uh, in. And this has gotten some amount of publicity. There's some reports on this. <clears throat> it ha in my opinion, it has nothing to do with the adequacy of epoxy to, to, for this purpose. It really has more to do with the way it was used there. Um, there is some statistics about retrofitted URMs, uh, those with systematic retrofits, as I mentioned. Even the systematic retrofits had some variation <coughs> in, in criteria. Uh, but here is the statistics in these uh, categories. And just for, to make a comparison, <coughs> the heavier, worse categories uh, were cut from 60% on unreinforced masonry uh, buildings that were uh, not retrofitted uh, to 30 percent. So it basically it cut those categories in half and there were virtually no or destroyed or major uh, damage categories for retrofitted <coughs> URM. So you'd have to say that the, that the retrofits uh, you know were, were successful but certainly did not prevent life-threatening damage completely which is something I think we have to consider here maybe a little bit. Now the casualties uh, have been mentioned several times. There were none in September, probably because it was in the morning. In February, it was right in the middle of the lunch hour. Uh, the CTV building, which I'll talk about in a minute, is a concrete building, 1986, killed 115 people. Pine Gould, which I'll also talk about, a little older concrete building, killed 18. And all other building collapses, which were mostly URMs, killed about 40. Now we've been saying, I think we being the structural engineers and Concrete Coalition and others have been saying that in the U.S. we certainly should fix the URMs. It's the most uh, vulnerable and obvious building to fix. However, from a, from a fatality standpoint, uh, many of us have said that the collapse of one moderate sized concrete building could be worse than uh, all the URMs that, uh, deaths that we've had in California uh, since 1906. Uh, this would indicate that might be the case. We have uh, 130 or 40 people uh, killed in two buildings and 42 killed in maybe another 500 buildings. We haven't had such a collapse of this co such a concrete building yet in this country. So let's talk a little bit about these two collapses uh, in Christchurch. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me see, are there any questions about URMs uh, quickly? experts here in Los Angeles. Seeing none, uh, we'll go on to the first of the two buildings is the Pine Gould Corporation building. Uh, it, it's an older concrete building built in 1963. Uh, and all, most of this information comes from a uh, extensive uh, review of the building that was done by the Department of Building and Housing. Uh, that, those reports eventually went to the Royal Commission where they were restudied again and kicked around and so all of this information is uh, available on the Royal Commission's website. Uh, the concrete structural system was a uh, interior core of very thin, uh, well, six inch concrete wall, single layer of steel. We, we, we do not think that's a great system anymore but uh, in those days it probably was used in this country as well. There were no gravity uh, pilasters or anything where the girders came in. The girders ran from this core to the outside columns. Uh, and the outside columns, of course, were gravity columns, so there was no ductility, apparently no deformation compatibility uh, worried about in the 60s. <clears throat> the girders uh, spanned to, to what looked even visually like incredibly small 
uh, columns. There were about 10 by 10 uh, inches at the perimeter. Uh, so these columns would seem to be uh, quite vulnerable. Uh, so this is a little bit light, but you can see at the ground level, ground to first level, you can hardly see the tower because there's a lot of other walls involved because of the utilities and all the other rooms down there. But then as soon as it got above the first level above the ground, the tower was uh, pristine. So it's pretty clear that this is the level, this is the weakest level, and sure enough, that's what failed. This particular level, there was hardly any damage in this uh, first level. So here's the the tower uh, of about of six inch walls with essentially number fours at 12, kind of a standard California design almost. Hardly any trim steel around the openings. It was almost like a typical detail, one number six or something. Uh, there were four transverse walls, one here that was almost solid, one at the other side of the elevator with a couple of doors, another one down here with a couple of doors, and then one at this end which had some utility uh, duct holes, uh, and then the Long walls were fairly solid with only a couple of uh, openings. This is north-south, this is east-west. Uh, this is, the, the orientation is, uh, is interesting. Or I, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, in September, uh, the motions, you've seen them already, that was kind of like their DBE, but they were oriented in the north-south uh, direction, which was the long direction of the tower. So when we look at a spectrum, we sort of don't look at directionality that much, but most of that motion was in north-south, so it was a little deceptive because the building was undamaged and green tagged and, and uh, uh, everybody went away and the people went back in the building. In February, the motions were also of short duration, but about two times the DBE have you seen and primarily oriented in the other direction, in the weak direction. So the tower uh, collapsed the, the tower collapsed to the east in this direction uh, and pulling down <coughs> the floors uh, with fairly large deformations, which in turn failed the exterior columns uh, and the, the thing collapsed, uh, killing 18 people. Uh, here's, uh, here's a, a photo. You can see the top of the tower hanging up here. Uh, some of the floors sort of hung and clung to the tower which may have saved a lot of people because you can see there's a lot of voids in here. There was clearly more than 18 people in the building. Um, and there, there were many uh, pictures of people being rescued from these locations like this and out here. So somehow uh, they, they, they could probably go up and down in the tower because the tower maintained uh, its shape. Now here is the undamaged uh, f first level above the ground. And here is the failure mode right here, uh, and it's, it's fairly clear that the, this wall is gone between the second and the, the first and second levels, uh, and the, 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 the wall collapsed towards the east. Now here are the tower cross walls that I mentioned. Uh, here's the, the one at the top of the sheet, uh, the north wall. You can see the duct openings, and most engineers, I think, in California would look at this and say, oh, look at these little piers that have almost no reinforcing, no trim bars. Uh, they're very short and squat. They're probably shear critical. This is a very bad wall. This is a real problem. And then you go the other way and you got a little bit more solid wall. You have a little bit of a, of a coupling beam action there. And then the wall at the, near the north end uh, is similar. And then there's one not shown, which is almost a solid uh, north wall. So probably an engineer looking at this would say, this is a problem with this building. Um, but the, it, the investigating engineer for the uh, Department of Building and Housing uh, did a nonlinear time history analysis and they were convinced that this uh, tower failed in flexure along the long east wall, the wall that goes right here and into the, uh, in and out of the screen. Uh, and it, they said nothing about the shear in this wall. Uh, so it the, the failure at this level uh, could have been looked the same, in my opinion, regardless of what failure mode it was. <clears throat> but it's interesting that what I think most people would see as the most obvious uh, weakness here is not the, uh, uh, the apparent uh, uh, failure mode. Now, it's interesting here because in 1997, the building changed hands. 
And just like here, there was a sort of a building evaluation, and the, uh, the investigating engineer said, well, uh, this building has these little tiny perimeter columns. They're very, very vulnerable. It wouldn't take very much drift to collapse them. Um, and they have a, a, an earthquake-prone federal law, which unfortunately I can't get into. It's very interesting, but they rate buildings on the percentage of the new building standard. So they have something called 33% NBS. And anything below 33 NBS is considered earthquake prone. It's very much like our old URM law, only this applies to all buildings, not just URMs. So this building, according to the uh, engineer who looked at it at the transfer of title, suggested that maybe this building was maybe 40 or 45 percent NBS. But the clear weakness was these perimeter columns. So why don't you put some steel tubes behind these columns? Nobody will see them. And they're sort of shoring columns so that when, if the drift uh, collapses these concrete columns, you won't have a complete collapse. And taking that deficiency away will raise the uh, earthquake-prone uh, rating to maybe 55 or 60 percent NBS. And to get it above that, you would have to attack fixing the tower or putting brace frames around. It was a very expensive proposition, so the, so the owner opted to put the tubes in. Uh, but not uh, do anything else. The columns, of course, that were put in were intended to protect against a couple of inches of drift. That's what the thinking was, not a couple of feet. So uh, when the tower basically collapsed and moved to the east a couple of feet, these, uh, these retrofitted columns were ineffective. It's not a criticism of the retrofit, it's just um, uh, no one foresaw that tower completely collapsing. Now this is a building that uh, I'm very familiar with because it was done by Rutherford and Shaquin and uh, we have some shoring columns behind uh, a concrete column so the exact same detail was used. Uh, hopefully the, the lateral system in the whole building is not going to allow the movement to be two feet or three feet so hopefully these will these will work better than that. But that detail is used occasionally in this country, particularly in URMs. So the other building I want to talk about is the CTV building. Uh, this is a more modern building, 1986. A similar study uh, paid for by the Department of Building and Housing and forwarded to the Royal Commission. <coughs> uh, these are precast uh, uh, beams pretty much for aesthetics. Uh, round columns, as you can see at the perimeter. Uh, and the lateral system is, uh, is, is, is designed, I mean this was in the era where engineers, you know, it was a real uh, coherent lateral system. There was a north core that was uh, reinforced concrete, the totally oriented outside the bulk of the building. Here's the, the north edge of the slab and the south edge of this core is there. So the tower is completely outside the building. And then at the other end, there was a couple shear wall uh, to sort of balance this a little bit. Obviously, there's still a lot of torsion. And then there was another unreinforced, or um, I'm sorry, CMU wall over here, which was put in for fire protection because there was another building here. This uh, CMU wall was supposedly separated from the columns, and there was some controversy about whether it was adequately separated or not. Um, then there was uh, the gravity system was precast starter beams, which I'll describe in a minute, on cast in place columns with no ductile detailing. Uh, and then a, they use uh, metal, uh, metal deck mixed up with concrete often in New Zealand. So there was long span metal deck and, and, and concrete fill spanning between these starter beams. There was a subtle, subtlety in their code that said if the drift of the building uh, with a certain percentage of the ultimate drift requ required uh, uh, caused by the MCE, then you, at some point you triggered either limited ductile or a full ductile detailing. But uh, apparently the state of the practice said if I have a shear wall building that really doesn't apply. So there really wasn't any calcs to figure it out. And if you read all these reports you'll find out it's a big controversy about whether ductile detailing should have been required or not. So here's the, the plan. You can see the north tower is completely outside the building, as I mentioned. The only uh, east-west 
Uh, shear wall is way out here. There isn't any, any here at all. Uh, and he, there's four walls in the other direction that takes the whole building. And then there's this couple shear wall down here. And the gravity uh, system or these starter beams, which I'll show in a minute, that span to interior columns. And then the metal decking was placed in between here and then the uh, decking cast. So uh, here is the gravity system details. Uh, here is a, the starter beam in elevation. It's precast. It's quite clever building in terms of eliminating shoring and being inefficient and all that kind of stuff. Here's a plan of the starter beam coming into the cast in place column. Bottom bars stick out and are hooked up. This shows a very nice overlap between those bars. In fact, sometimes they didn't overlap. They were like this. Um, so this detail is not, was not executed as, uh, as well as could have been. Um, here is a starter beam section. It's just a square precast section with stirrups sticking up, ready for some negative bars to be put in uh, over the columns. The positive bars, as I said, uh, were bent up at every, at every column. And then uh, the starter beam plan had this round end to, to allow the uh, cast in place concrete to run through and the curved surface was completely smooth. It was formed and it was one of the best concrete surfaces I've ever seen. It was absolutely smooth. Uh, and I don't think that was the intention, but that's the way it was. And as, as you'll see later, that I think was a significant uh, issue. Uh, there was uh, two inches of cover on a relatively small 16 inch beam or column, I'm sorry and uh, only one inch seating for these precast beams. Uh, there, a lot of the academics that analyze these columns said that this large cover was part of the problem because the column was small to begin with. When the cover spalled, there was, it took a huge percentage of the total area of the concrete out. And so there was maybe uh, the column failed right below, uh, right below this joint. But the, again, like uh, the other building, there's a lot of different theories about what actually happened here. So the north, uh, again, just like the other building, any engineer would look at this building and find an absolutely flagrant problem and identify it. And that was that the north tower was, was not connected into the building. Uh, for the north-south direction, there were no collectors, which you would think in this country you would have some bars coming out of every one of those walls into the, uh, into the slab. Uh, th those did not, were not present. And uh, across this line four, in order to get the load from the bulk of the diaphragm into the whatever part of the diaphragm existed within the tower, there was uh, the typical detail here that we've seen before with, a with number fours at eight going across to drag all of the load in the north-south direction somewhere. It's unclear where they were dragging it because once it got into this little piece of diaphragm, there's really no connection to any of the walls. In the east-west direction, uh, this is all a void. So the only uh, connection to the, uh, the east-west shear wall is through this little piece right here. So in both directions, not so good. And everyone, as I'd say, right after the earthquake, people got these drawings and everybody said, ah, oh, look at what happened, that this is really the problem. Uh, similar to the Pine Gould building, there was a change of hands of this building. An engineer looked at it and said, gee, there's no connection of the tower to the slab. I recommend before you buy the building that you fix that. And <coughs> uh, and there was some little, uh, what I would call little connectors done in. Why were they so little? Well, because in those days, the diaphragm requirements in New Zealand were very modest. So it didn't require very much load to be collected. So they put some little uh, angles that connected to the, this wall and this wall. They added nothing over here and nothing over here, apparently on the idea that the load could come inside this diaphragm and then get into those walls. Again, here's the elevation of these collectors. It's just an angle where bolts were put into the 
wall and one flange of the angle and then a uh, bolt went up into the slab uh, through the other uh, angle. And it was only done at levels four, five, and six. Why was that? The only reason I can figure out is because they rationalized that they could get the load in because it was much lower at levels one and two. They could get the load in without uh, doing this. Relatively inexpensive. Why they cut the cut it so fine? Uh, you know, we don't know. You can. There's hours and hours of testimony on this building on the Royal Commission website. Um, it probably was never explained adequately. Um, in September, again, similar to the Pine Gold building, this building was essentially untouched. There was no damage. Uh, no one reported anything happening uh, along that interface. Uh, uh, of the building with the tower. The building is green tagged. Uh, it was fully occupied in February and it, it suffered, unlike the pine gold, it suffered a real pancake collapse where one floor literally came down on top of the other, at least for the bottom four floors, and it killed 115. So here's uh, the, the rubble. You can see, sure enough, the tower stayed there, so there was a disconnection. Uh, here's another uh, a view. And the south wall and stairway, which you saw in the front of the building, actually was on top of the pile. So clearly the inside of the building started collapsing and then pulled that stairway onto it. Uh, although it did not pull the, the big uh, north tower onto it. And that's the question, of course, is did the, did the floors pull away from the tower, causing excess drift, causing the gravity system to collapse? or did the gravity system collapse to begin with and, and the floors pull off the tower because of the lousy connection. Uh, it's pretty clear that the gravity system was very brittle. It could do calculations and they were shear critical. I mean, the, the joints were unreinforced. There were all kinds of issues about that. And I didn't show you the perimeter detail, which is slightly bigger because of those precast uh, architectural beams, but uh, it, it also had some issues. Um, so the, what caused the amplified deformations that may have caused the gravity column to collapse? Well, the, it could have come uh, pulled away from the North Tower. There's an elastic torsion because the building is basically uh, uh, not symmetrical, uh, or this non-structural CMU at one side could have caused a lot bigger torsion. Or you could have inelastic torsion because the couple wall yielded and then the, at the south side you had a very floppy uh, side so you had a lot of torsion. So torsion was thought perhaps to be a problem. And then you couple that with the extreme sensitivity of the gravity system. How much drift did it require to, to actually collapse that system? Um, the poorly confined 16 inch round columns were very highly stressed by calculation, particularly at the lower levels. The beam column uh, was unconfined and could have failed in, in a classic joint shear if you, if you displaced that frame very far. Or the details of the precast starter beam, uh, which, which I sort of described a little bit, could have caused these connections to just blow apart, resulting in this massive collapse. So all of these things were discussed and argued and debated back and forth. And in my opinion, probably a little bit of both of these things happened. Uh, uh, however, interestingly, there was no clear evidence that the failure of the diaphragm connection to the wall uh, happened before the collapse. Matter of fact, there's some evidence to suggest the collapse started first and pulled away from the tower. So the, again, similar to the Pine Gold, the interesting thing is the deficiency that almost every engineer would find in this building right off the bat was probably not what brought it down. So it's, uh, it's pretty interesting that you had two of these buildings that had this similar kind of a characteristic. Uh, now my favorite theory is this precast starter beam detail was, uh, was the bad actor. Uh, I'm, everyone is not in total agreement with me, but uh, one of the uh, USAR engineers at the site came to the Royal Commission pretty late and said, look, I got a whole bunch of pictures of the rubble and I got some theories and I think this happened and that happened and everybody said, gee, why don't you come and testify? And uh, there was some pretty, in very interesting uh, evidence that they brought. Uh, and he, he drew this uh, picture which shows the uh, detail of the column. 
And you have to remember that all of this surface is just as smooth as your baby's bottom. Uh, and so if you have a little negative moment coming in here, you have this compression uh, coming in where he drew these little arrows and you get over to where this angle is, there's no way to resist that other than this outward force. And the outward force would just knock those wings off. And sure enough, both of these USAR engineers said they didn't see one beam in that whole set of rubble where this hadn't happened. Every single one was cracked off and every single beam was uh, disconnected from the column. They saw no column beam joints anywhere. They were all uh, disconnected. So, so that uh, compression there just knocks those wings off uh, and you can go out to the site where the rubble is and you can find these pieces uh, of that smooth surface and it's amazing. There's no bond, no, no indication of any bond whatsoever. So uh, that, that sort of got me thinking that this joint is what, is what started to fall apart first. Once that joint fell apart, these beams could fall off and have no vertical load support in the whole thing because it came down apparently very fast after the earthquake straight down. So again, if you look at that beam connection and imagine that's what it's going to happen, that's what it's going to look like, I don't think any of us want to go in that building uh, where this overlap here is one inch. <laughs> that's, the, that's the vertical load connection. So anyway, that's my favorite uh, uh, per, uh, reason for this collapse, although there's many other things that could have happened, uh, including just standard frame action causing uh, the column to, to fail uh, below. But there's no consensus really on the exact mechanism uh, of the collapse. So there's, uh, I think, many potential lessons from Christchurch. We have two partial retrofits, and they may have worked in September, although there's no evidence they were even exercised in September. Uh, but they were there, and nothing happened to the buildings. But the buildings were clearly very brittle. They had, uh, they had a lot of elastic strength, but once you exceeded that, they were extremely brittle and came down. So the identification of the most critical deficiency was difficult, as I pointed out. I think most of us would have identified the wrong or something that didn't really bring it down in the end. And secondly, are we really considering what happens if the loading that we're required to look at is exceeded? ASC 41 says if you do a pushover, go to 50% beyond what you're required to see what happens. I mean, I think that's an excellent idea because if you have a cliff on your pushover right beyond where your demand is, you could have a situation like this where the building performs okay for the design event, but a little bit more and it comes down. Uh, and I think it makes us ask the questions, are we fixing existing buildings uh, fast enough for older concrete? And we, I think we know the answer to that. We're not fixing them at all. And are we fixing URMs well enough? We've done a lot of URMs in this, uh, in, certainly in California, certainly the early ones are, are a little questionable how good they will be. Um, and our, our cities uh, think that since we have these retrofit programs that they will have no URM problems. Because I think we will have URM problems if we have this ex uh, extreme shaking. So what happens in the US, and this has been brought up by other speakers, it will be being brought up again by Lori, what happens in the U.S. if intense motions hit a highly urbanized area? We've actually never had this happen. Uh, are our codes adequate for individual buildings? That was brought up again. Or uh, what about for the community? If the individual owner is happy f for what his codes are providing, what about the community when uh, all the buildings are damaged or red tagged or can't be used? So we have to think about these things, I think. Um, so before I go ahead uh, into Chile building, uh, are there any questions about these buildings? Bill, isn't it rather immaterial as to exactly what brought that, those buildings down? Because if it wasn't that way, it was going to go down due to other factors that were obviously inadequate. Uh, yes, somewhat. Uh, th there seemed to be a, a, a lot of choices. It becomes somewhat an academic argument at some point because people like to say, I mean, that's what the Royal Commission was all about is what happened. And so um, when, when the Department of Building and Housing report says this happened and then there's five experts lined up and say, no, that didn't happen, this happened, then the Royal Commission says, well, come on, somebody must be able to tell me what happened. So 
Then there was an issue about uh, looking at other buildings in New Zealand that had whatever the characteristic was that failed the building. For example, if they said, well, it was just the non-ductile detailing of the gravity frame, if someone said that's the reason, then they would look at every building in, uh, in New Zealand that didn't have, that didn't have du ductile detailing on the gravity. Well, maybe that's way conservative. What if my theory is right that it's the precast detailing that caused the problem? Then they should be looking at a different set of buildings. They should be looking at the buildings that have precast beams, perhaps. So it, it does make a difference uh, in some cases what exactly happened. Yeah. You suppose the contractor proposed the precast beams the way they are were built there versus what the original design was? No, the, all of that is known in great detail because of the Royal Commission. I mean, there are hours and hours and hours of testimony and reports on this on the CTV building. It's the most detailed investigation I've ever seen that went public. I mean, there's been some detailed investigations of, for legal cases that you never see. All this stuff is public. Um, there is no question that the engineer who designed the CTV building worked with contractors. He was that kind of an engineer that designed, build, and let's make it, uh, you know, how can we make it cheaper and more, you know, more efficient and so on. Uh, interestingly, there was a, another building that they had put up uh, just uh, a few years before that had a lot of the same characteristics, but they had square columns. Their starter beams were U-shaped, and they were able to get bottom bars that went straight across the joint. Uh, so incredibly subtle change in detail changed the whole thing. So th they gave this building to a young engineer and said, do it like that. Oh, by the way, though, the architect wants round columns and the contractor wants square starter beams. So probably, you know, I, my, my speculation as a young engineer didn't understand the subtleties of the differences. How the ends of the precast beams were not sandblasted or something is unclear. The spec said, without being at all specific on the drawing, the spec said any concrete that is going to be next to a uh, cast in place concrete should be sandblasted. So that didn't happen. I'm not sure sandblasting was enough. It probably would have been something more than that, but even that wasn't done. So whether that would have saved it or not is unclear. So there, there were, you know, the, 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 the history of the design of the building is fascinating. If you, if, if you follow it and go and read some of this uh, reports or listen to the testimony, um, there's all kinds of interesting stories about that that unfortunately I can't get into. Any other questions? The book about Grand Chancellor, that's another famous one there. It is. I'm not covering that today. <laughs> can you tell us anything about that? It well, yeah, I can, I can tell you pretty much anything you want to know about it. Um, the, its collapse was caused by a bearing wall at the first level, and uh, it had the lo vertical load on that wall was like a quarter of the building or more because a whole bunch of things that were going on upstairs, cantilevers that went on other cantilevers and this is and that, and then it was at the corner, uh, the bottom of the building, the bottom nine floors were shear walls, the top, they added, uh, I can't remember how many, 12 floors on top that were shear walls, I mean that were uh, moment frames. The two per perimeter moment frames came at a corner right over that same shear wall, the, uh, the same wall. So those overturning moments, you know, came down in the same location where all this big cantilever was and one thing and another. So there's enormous axial load on this little wall that was in the lobby. And that wall failed. And you can look at it and say it failed in, in shear wall action, compression, uh, sort of like the chili buildings. Or you can say it just failed out of due compression. Again, there's all kinds of arguments about exactly what caused it to fail. But it was clearly the fact that there was just an enormous amount of contributors to load in that building. The other characteristic about that building is that uh, it, it was designed, completely designed, and then they had a fight with the next door owner, and the owner says, no, I gave you only permission to use this 20 foot for a driveway at the first level. I didn't give you an easement for all of, of everything, uh, or the other way around, I guess. So um, uh, they had to take out all the columns at the first level for 20 feet. 
So every floor of a 21-story building was cantilevered 20 feet. And so it was totally unsymmetrical. So you had this building that every, you know, every floor had 20-foot cantilever, putting huge moments. So you had actually a lateral force on the building before you started. It's like a sloping column. Nobody know whether that really had much to do with it either, but the cantilever certainly uh, put huge loads into that one corner again. So there, again, that's another one of the Department of Building and Housing reports. So th that, that building is studied in detail as well in that documentation. Yeah, it, it was short, eight to, eight to 10 seconds in both, both of them. Uh, so it was, uh, it was discussed, it has been discussed, there was a pulse uh, and there was some a long period uh, energy that could have affected some of these buildings. Uh, there was a very, very high vertical accelerations which people have variously said, uh, I think that affected it or I don't think it did. Uh, I think I've developed my own belief that Vertical accelerations probably don't affect you very much unless you have a very brittle structure. If you have very brittle columns that are about ready to go and you get a big vertical kick, I think it could cause it to collapse. If you have a normally detailed column, I'm not sure that incredibly one second pulse of vertical energy is going to do much, but it turns out both of these buildings had that kind of a brittle element. Okay, I think I got to move on. Let's move to Chile. Uh, everybody has seen this building, Alta Rio. Uh, it's 15 stories tall, very, very recent design, 2006. Lots of shear wall area. Uh, the, the Chileans building code follows ACI 318, except that uh, they made a decision uh, 15, 20 years ago not to include the confined boundary elements in walls. They had a fairly a good reason for that. Their buildings, uh, the, these are almost all residential buildings. They put a lot of walls in it. The rule of thumb was 3% of the f floor area in shear walls. Uh, that created a, a fairly good situation, but just like any structural system over the years, it sort of transitioned. The, the uh, developers forced the engineers, let's make the walls a little skinnier. So instead of eight inches, they maybe went to six inches. And then the developer said, let's not build them 12 stories, let's build them 15 stories. And the engineers were still using a 3% rule. So you end up with very high compressive uh, loads on these uh, bearing walls. And that slow transition and these very high uh, uh, compressive stresses were part of the problem. So this is a typical plan. This is the plan of this building, but it's also typical of many of them. You have a central corridor with uh, shear walls for the longitudinal direction and transverse uh, uh, shear walls, which the developers like this system because these are very soundproof for their uh, condominiums. You can see these walls are solid. And then there was also another intermediate wall that was, that was very short. You can see that the, the also this system sets up a flanged wall so that these transverse walls always have a big flange that, uh, that creates some issues, as we'll see. So if you take a section through where a solid wall was, uh, here's a solid wall. And near the bottom, and this was characteristic of many, many of these buildings, uh, they often had a setback. This one is very, very small, but it was often larger. And the reason for this setback is that this was to allow for car traffic, because they had parking down here. So they often had these walls which became known as flag walls. Um, so this discontinuity caused some issues. Then if you look at the little tiny uh, wall that's an intermediate wall, uh, it looks like this. And so you, you, when this thing is set back, you almost lose completely uh, this little wall. And this transition uh, was done many different ways by different uh, contractors. There were some investigators of this building that thought this was really the problem, that all of these failed and uh, caused loss of axial support. And then it transferred to here, which in turn failed those. That's, that's not necessarily a majority opinion. So what were the ground motions? Uh, here were the ground motions in the background. This was two different soil profiles. The crack section property uh, uh, period of the building was about 0.8 seconds. And you would look at this 
and say anybody who does any nonlinear analysis would say, oh, as this building goes nonlinear more, it's the period's going to lengthen, it's going to get out into this huge mountain of energy, and that's going to bring it down. Uh, it turns out that the building uh, fail, failed and fell down long before it ever got to this mountain of energy. So it actually failed due to the, uh, due to the energy at this level. So th there was some, uh, a lot of uh, forensic uh, work was done on the building uh, to try to figure out what happened. At the grade level where it failed, uh, the, the condition where the wall went all the way through that I showed you before, you can see that it had a very uh, short plastic hinge length. Uh, whereas in the United States, we usually assume that maybe the plastic hinge length is half the length of the wall. In, in Chile, we saw it over and over again being about twice the thickness of the wall. So a lot of different assumptions. Uh, there a huge amount of damage right here because uh, there was these classic openings that came down for the corridor and at some point they stopped. So there was all kinds of uh, shear going on here from overturning of these two walls. There was more damage there than other places. Then if you look at the other little wall that I showed you, uh, that some people thought this was the cause of collapse. You can see there's similarly it was a solid wall here that was affected by the overturning and also had a very, very short plastic hinge length. So there have been analytical studies uh, of, of the wall uh, done by uh, Professor Maley's uh, students and it showed that at about uh, 0.8 drift uh, the, the wall boundary crushed, and once that wall boundary crushed, uh, it basically uh, lost support, uh, and this particular building fell over. Now, there, there were many, many other buildings that looked very similar that had damage but did not fall over or did not collapse. So the nonlinear time history shows like this, and you'd say, well, look at the, this big offset, and then all of a sudden it kept responding. That's actually not true because this, uh, this particular PERFORM 3D analysis does not model collapse well, so it just keeps going even though the wall is crushed over here. So the, the building actually collapsed or the wall crushed over here, so this is sort of a uh, not real part of the analysis. So here's what the building looked like. This uh, broken back in the middle was because they were building another building there that was partially up and when it tipped over it hit that uh, and, and broke its back again. Uh, it did collapse toward the side of the flag walls that I was pointing out, those di discontinuities. Um, the building was so new that it hadn't been all been sold, it was only 70% sold. I can't remember the exact uh, number of occupants. I think it's between 60 and 80 at the time of the collapse and only eight people died. Uh, it's hard to believe, but uh, there was a lot of spaces in here uh, as it came down. It would have been a fairly painful ride, I would assume. So how did these concrete buildings of this type perform in general? Well, Considering only the, the more modern buildings between 85 and 2009, there was only four that collapsed. Uh, one completely collapsed, the other ones actually had only partial collapses. Uh, and there's some other statistics here, but the interesting thing is that the number of buildings we're talking about are in the 10,000s. And so if you look at this ratio, is only 0.04% of the buildings collapse. That is pretty darn good performance. We'd be happy with that performance. We're talking about 10% perhaps of our buildings maybe collapsing or partially collapsing in the MCE. So this is a very, very small number. Uh, so why, why bother? Why are we even looking at this with this great performance? Well. The damage uh, that we're looking here is systematic. We kept seeing the same thing over and over again. These walls crushed. So what are we doing wrong? There must be something we can fix to, to not only keep these, uh, the same performance as far as collapsing, but uh, make them better. So ACI has been looking at this. Uh, what is the main problem? Well, the main problem is very high axial stresses caused by uh, the 3% rule and taller buildings and thinner walls, uh, inadequate confinement because they didn't adopt the ACI confinement rules, although most people think that even if they had, that probably would not have saved them. Uh, very thin walls, uh, flange sections. Uh, 
So in the flange section, you have a huge amount of tension steel available in this whole section, which causes an enormous amount of compression on that tip. If this, didn't, if this flange section wasn't here, then the tension steel out here might yield first, and that would be okay, because uh, then, then you would not have this sudden uh, crushing. Um, our current requirements where special confinement is not required, and I'll explain to you, and I'm going to get a little bit technical for the, for the emergency planners in the audience, but <coughs> this is what ACI is doing. First of all, U.S. normally has thicker walls than this, although it's not required. Um, the U.S. detailing says, in any case, even if special confinement is not required, you have to have hoop sets at uh, eight inches in center or less. However, it's pretty well convinced now that these hoops will not, are not sufficient to achieve ductile yielding of this compression zone. So if you do have a flange wall <coughs> or some other reason which is going to cause you compression yielding, uh, this is not going to be ductile uh, at this level. So you're going to get this very short plastic hinge length uh, akin to about two uh, times a wall thickness the way they did down there. Our current uh, trigger for boundary element has to do with the amount of drift uh, compared with the plastic uh, hinge length, and we assume that length to be the length of the wall over two, as I said, and the amount of strain you can uh, take in here. So there's a rule that says uh, that if, the <coughs> if this is not met uh, with this 600 number, then you have to confine the uh, cord. The proposal now is to actually double this so that uh, the assumption is that, that you'll have a very short plastic hinge length <coughs> to accept the strain. And so you'll have to confine uh, if, if this equation is not met. So the result is that except for very short buildings, uh, you're going to have special confinement for most of these uh, walls. So that's one change that is being uh, considered. So many more walls will be confined. Um, what is the confinement going to be? Well, uh, th there was a formula that was used before for confinement. It looks very much like a column, but this particular formula was developed specifically for cords and walls. There was another formula. Well, we're going to show you this first. Uh, <coughs> there's another formula that will be added that will cause way more confinement steel to be put in. Now, just to show the fact that in all probability our current thin wall uh, rules in this uh, country are not adequate. Uh, this is a pure compression test on a thin wall. Uh, and this shows you the uh, strain levels over here. You can see they start out at pink and they get worse and worse with yellow and uh, green and blue and you can see that happening in this uh, fairly interesting uh, demonstration. find the where's the mouse oh, we, oh there you go okay I can't see it here sorry so this is a pure compression test so you can see the the levels are, are up in this level I guess it's changing, huh? No, it's not. Oh. So you start to see a little bit of darker color in here, green is getting in this area. <coughs> 
point of this is when, when it fails, you'll see a relatively short uh, plastic hinge length again, which basically says that the way we're <coughs> now dealing with uh, th this problem is, is not going to uh, get the strain <coughs> over a long enough uh, section to prevent a, a uh, to, to get ductile yielding. So I've said before that we're going to add another equation. This equation was originally uh, uh, developed for columns, and for whatever reason, and in the last ACI, there was some uh, disagreement as to whether both of these had to be applied to the end of a wall or only one of them, and it was finally decided to only apply one of them. <clears throat> They're now going to reverse that decision and apply this one, which apparently governs a lot of the time, so you're going to have a lot more steel in, in confinement uh, as in per 318 uh, year 14. And also there will be no unsupported uh, walls allowed uh, uh, in, in the uh, in, in region. There was also some buckled walls both in uh, Christchurch and Chile and uh, the, the buckled wall is again thought to be a, a large part of this uh, flanged wall problem <coughs> whereas the um, the wall goes in this direction and the, you get tension yielding out here uh, and then it comes back in the other direction and in this area that's yield you have buckling but actually uh, uh, many tests have now shown that that may be not be the case that in fact uh, this co high compression load uh, causes spalling out here which weakens the wall enough that causes the, the uh, buckling. So the, it's basically a thickness issue of the wall. So there's going to be new uh, requirements for minimum thicknesses uh, of, of the wall uh, in the newer ACI. Now there's also some issues in New Zealand which haven't really been uh, uh, considered yet by ACI. One of them is that there were cases of uh, wall reinforcement that actually fractured uh, and so there, were no, there was no yielding at all in uh, both Chile and uh, several in New Zealand. And the theory here is that um, if you have concentrated longitudinal bars or at least enough bars to uh, exceed the tension capacity of the concrete, you're going to get a lot of cracks because if one crack forms, there's enough steel to uh, prevent that crack from opening and it goes to the next crack, the next crack, so you get a long area over which to take this yielding. But if you don't have very much uh, reinforcement, when you get one crack, there is nothing strong enough to spread that, uh, uh, to create another crack. So all of the strain occurs across one crack and that quickly will fracture the reinforcement. So uh, Professor Maley uh, is suggesting that the blue book which now says uh, you should distribute the cord uh, uh, reinforcement in a shear wall over the length of the wall uh, using certain rules, he, th he thinks that may be the partially the cause of this problem. So he would suggest uh, not doing that but concentrating the cord steel at the end of the wall. ACI really doesn't tell you what to do. The, re the idea of spreading it over the length of the wall is really a Sea Hawk Blue Book idea, um, and there's some good reasons for it, but uh, because of this uh, issue of fracturing, uh, you may want to look at that. The other way of handling it is if you have a, if you have a lot of steel, uh, regardless of how it's distributed in the wall, uh, and have enough to overcome the tension capacity of the concrete, then when that one crack forms, uh, you're going to get uh, other cracks as you get strain hardening in the steel. So th this has not really been directly uh, dealt with by ACI uh, yet. There was also some con concrete moment frame issues. Uh, the Clarendon is a famous one in, uh, in New Zealand, Christchurch. 19-story perimeter frame, beautiful building, has uh, concrete moment frames on all four sides. Uh, it was opened in 1988. Uh, it, it, had, it was built literally on top of the ancient, or not the ancient, but the old historic uh, uh, Clarendon uh, that has a very famous balcony right here, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, it had precast double T units, which they use a lot, uh, with a topping slab. Uh, as the gravity frame uh, and precast stairs. Uh, 
This was one of the 11 buildings that had precast stair failures, which I'll talk about in a minute. This claim to fame of this building is that in 1994, the Beatles came to Christ Church and um, held court on this balcony, which they managed to save uh, to, the, to the thrill of many Christ Church young women, I'm sure. Uh, the, the problem in this moment frame and many others in New Zealand was that you get, you get uh, elongation of the frame. So basically, if you uh, take a concrete beam and take it up and down, up and down, every time it opens at one side, it never closes completely, and then it'll open at the other side, so the actual beam, the actual beam elongates. Uh, they've been tested in New Zealand in the lab to show that this happens in reality. They've been worrying about it for a long time. The U.S. has never worried about it, perhaps because our diaphragms are more solid and not precast and will hold the, the confine this together. Although I'm not totally convinced, we really don't have any moment frames <clears throat> that have been through any major events, so we don't know. But there's been enough uh, tests to, uh, to show that this, is, this definitely happens. This is not some theory. And it's actually almost a straight line relationship. So the rule of thumb is that if you get 2.5% lateral drift uh, in your moment frame, it will probably produce 2.5% of elongation of the frame. You take 2.5% of a four bay 25 foot frame, <laughs> it's a big number. So uh, what happens uh, is that you, you will have this beam growth in your moment frame. And at some point near the base, of course, the, 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 the grade beams are not gonna grow. So you could have this problem. Uh, at, at, if you look at this floor in plan, you have uh, with a, a perimeter frame, you got both things growing, so it's pushing that corner column out. What happened in the Clarendon is because they had precast T units that were sitting on a ledge, as the building elongated, it started pulling those T's off their support, and none of them collapsed, but there were many floors that were literally hanging on by maybe a quarter of an inch of bearing. Um, so this building is, is out of here. And this building has, if it's not demolished now, it will be soon. So this has not been considered either by ACI yet. So um, that's it for the concrete buildings. Uh, any questions on any of that material? Yes? Well, it was very strong, has been pointed out. Oh, yes, it, uh, ask about vertical acceleration, uh, which I was positive I would get that question. I got it in Salt Lake, so, and I'm sure you'll be in Seattle and San Francisco. Uh, I can't give you a very definitive answer. As you probably know, if any of the analysts uh, here, it's very hard to do a three-dimensional nonlinear time history that actually considers the vertical modes of the building because that very, very high vertical acceleration is about 0.1 second uh, period. So it turns out some floors and buildings are about at that level, so you could start to get some amplification like that, but a lot of the mass of the building is in columns and in walls and other parts, so you're not going to get that huge acceleration amplification for the entire mass of the structure, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is it's extremely short duration, so uh, what th there's a lot of tests that show that concrete and steel strengths at short duration loading is different than, so to actually include it in an analysis is very difficult. Um, several of the reports done by the uh, Department of Building and Housing that I've discussed suggest that they go through all of their analysis and then sort of at the last minute they say, oh yes, and there was very large vertical ground motions, maybe that had something to do with it. But nobody actually came up with any definitive way of looking at it. Uh, again, I think that perhaps if you have a very brittle s structure, like the CTV building had these columns that were very highly loaded and not very well confined, actually very poorly confined, and you had all this stuff going on and all of a sudden you get hit you know, with a, additional vertical ground motion, I think that could, that could do it. I think in a normal uh, circumstance, uh, it probably w would not have much of an effect. 
And as you know, we use, we use a little bit of vertical ground motion in most of our designs, but certainly we're not talking about one and a half or two G, uh, what, what actually happened. So I think for older buildings, it's something we should consider. If you, if you have a situation, most of the time, if you have such a brittle column in a retrofit, for example, you're gonna wrap it or you're gonna do something anyway uh, to, to make that uh, column better, so. Um, well, the, uh, the uh, Hotel Grand Chancellor had a, clearly a compression collapse of this uh, shear wall and whether vertical ground motions along with all the other loads coming into that wall had something to do with it very well could have. Whether you take the ground motion away, would it have not collapsed? Uh, unlikely, but maybe. Um, there was a compelling photograph that I saw uh, of a library that was in renovation and, and they had a bunch of steel tables uh, piled with books uh, and several of the tables had failed uh, vertically and none of the books had fallen off so there was it was not a lateral load issue so something just caused these things to to fail vertically so clearly there were large vertical accelerations and they, they would certainly affect certain things, uh, but uh, how, much, how much in general is hard to say. Yes? It seemed that you were saying that there's going to be more confinement required in these boundary elements. And I don't do tall buildings, but I understand that we're going with higher strength rebar now. It's going to be having less confinement. Well, there's some... There's some there's some studies uh, going on that's uh, funded by NIST, the National Institute of Science and, Te and uh, Technology, uh, on use of higher strength uh, rebar and what its effects will be. So it's being studied. Um, most of those real tall buildings, uh, the engineers can find everything anyway. So I think it's I think it's an intermediate building, you know, a, maybe a developer condo or something that's 10 or 12 stories. Those are the kind of buildings that probably will be affected by these rules. If that one picture I showed was a 50-story core building and you, you know, there, there's, you could get no more confinement in there. So, uh, but the, the high string steel is an issue and I think it's being studied uh, as we speak. I got to move on, sorry. Um, Non-structural, I had to throw it in uh, because again, it was shown if you don't protect your non-structural elements, they're gonna get hammered. Uh, this was in uh, Chile, a hospital. Not only did the ceilings come down, but the lights came down, the uh, registers, everything came down. This building was fairly new, but had to be evacuated. This was in Christchurch, almost identical picture, you could argue. Uh, I, all of this non-structural damage in Christchurch uh, was costed by the insurance companies and I think it contributed if an owner, as Lori will describe, wanted to get out of Christchurch because downtown was dead, <coughs> they could use the, the fact that the, the buildings had to be gutted and replaced with the non-structural as a way to get the cost of repair way up because it, uh, that's, they had to, that's the only way they could have used the buildings again. There was that much damage. Now again, books fall off, all the racks uh, uh, you know, were completely damaged. So this is all just lessons relearned, but in those areas are, uh, that don't provide any uh, protection for non-structural, um, neither Christchurch nor Chile uh, paid much attention to it, even though it was in their codes, uh, and you know, they suffered the consequences. So the non-structural lessons are more of the same. The overhead ceilings, lights, and mechanical are extremely vulnerable. Water damage, which we always worry about, uh, was not very common, but again, when it happens, it's very damaging because the water goes through the whole building. We did see some of it. Unanchored equipment and furnishing will move around and racks and contents are vulnerable. And I mentioned that the non-structural damage in Christchurch contributed to insurance write-offs. Stairs. In, uh, in New Zealand, uh, they use a lot of precast concrete stairs. They're not common here, except for very small, maybe uh, two and three story buildings. Uh, 
but they use them in high-rise buildings the way we use commercial steel stairs. There's three possible causes of failure. Uh, the fixed stairs uh, will take loading. If, the, if they're fixed fixed, they'll be like a brace frame and they'll get damaged. If you try to put a slider at one end to the other, if the bearing is too small, they literally will fall down, which happened in Christchurch. And in some cases, they might have had enough freeboard to slide, but they didn't have any compression distance. So when the building drifted in one way, it squeezed the stair, made it go inelastic, caused it to be bent, which meant it's shorter. So then when it went the other way, you didn't get the free board you thought you had, and down it came. So there's a lot of different ways. There were 11 buildings that had a failure or damage in this way. Um, the most famous one is Forthite Bar, Bar, which is almost a brand new building, uh, many stories. And this picture was taken because the people literally could not get out. There were 12 stories of stairs that was just a big hole in the building. So they, uh, they resorted to all kinds of inventive ways uh, to get out of the building. So this is looking up at a fixed uh, stair. You can see the, um, uh, the, the drift caused this uh, failure at the bend in the stairs between the, the stair run and the landing. as would be a common uh, thing to see. Um, the stairs with sliding connections. These two connections were often used uh, in Christchurch. You can see for whatever reason they, they, they had a lot of freeboard here but not very much compression distance for whatever reason. I, don't ask me why. So this is a case where uh, if the drift occurred towards the middle you would squeeze a stair and then going the other way it would fall off and this, this shows this. So this stair uh, is compressed and bent and stays in this inelastic uh, uh, configuration. And then when the earthquake reverses, it doesn't have the same freeboard it had before and collapses. This is in the Forsyth Bar. Uh, you can see that uh, this, this particular stair is hanging on, but this run over here is gone completely. Uh, this is a picture at the bottom of the building where a whole bunch of runs of stairs have all piled up uh, at, at the bottom and fallen through this shaft. Um, New Zealand uh, uh, is now reacting to this by saying you have to use one and a half times the MCE drifts to provide that kind of a, of a slider because uh, they don't want this to happen. Uh, we use a lot of steel stairs. I think they're still susceptible. We have never really dealt with this very much. We just have commercial stairs and say, put in a stair, and a commercial guy comes in and puts it in. If you've ever looked at those, they don't really have much provision for any movement. The recent tests of a five-story building at UC San Diego Shake Table had such a commercial stair. They got a lot of uh, uh, nice uh, uh, contractors and suppliers to supply stuff to put in that building. Usually when a, somebody is going to supply something, they're going to put it in perfectly to make sure that it really works well. This commercial stair person came in and actually put one in typical, <laughs> and it was a pretty, pretty poor installation. And uh, at, at drifts, realistic drifts, the, all the wells of the connections broke. It did not collapse, but it shows that our steel stairs are in fact vulnerable uh, to this drift problem. You can design a steel stair with sliding bearings. If you try to do it, you'll find out it's a very complex uh, thing to do. It's possible, but uh, complex. The other thing you can do is, is design the end connection with a ductile yielding element so that when you get this uh, motion, rather than sliding, it actually bends something, uh, but it's ductile. So let's quickly go into isolation uh, in Japan. Uh, there was 17 buildings that actually saw a very strong round motion. We've never had that many uh, buildings at, at, at once that, uh, that got exercised at all. Um, many of these buildings had displacements of 8 inches. Uh, one had 16 inches. Before, we've had many uh, buildings go through earthquakes and have had 2 inches of displacement or 1 inch or a quarter inch. Never anything approaching 16 inches, so that makes us people who've designed some isolation feel a little bit better. The superstructures of these buildings uh, and universally almost suffered no damage, so they worked, so to speak. Um, th they use a lot of lead dampers in, uh, in Japan, and there was certainly damage there. You would expect if something moves 16 inches, the dampers are going to get exercised as well. Um, and there was typically uh, damage at the expansion joints, which is 
no big deal. It's an architectural detail. Uh, it is expensive to fix it, but it also, there could be something hidden in there that will cause your short circuit of your motion. So you probably have to look at those uh, interfaces with the other buildings and the moat very carefully. So here's uh, the kind of uh, steel damper they use, is bent steel. You can see obviously it was exercised. This is kind of a lead, uh, this is a lead rubber uh, damper that they use that, w that shows some cracking. Here's another one of the, of the uh, steel dampers. Here's a case in Chile uh, where the building performed wonderfully, but again, the, all of the joints around the edge of the building and interfaces with other buildings in the moat were poorly designed and they had damage uh, almost all the way around the building. Again, this is a women's hospital in Christchurch, an isolated building, uh, again, that performed okay, not perfectly, but uh, clearly the, this plate, I think, was designed to slide over this piece of concrete, but it got hung up. And at some point, uh, something as strong as this will start to short circuit your isolation. Now this was the uh, bearing in Christchurch, and after September, uh, the, the isolation world was a buzz because there was a permanent displacement uh, of about one inch in that isolation. We've never really seen that before. It could have been the perimeter conditions that held it over. It's not really clear. But before anybody could worry about whether they should do anything about it, the five or six significant earthquakes that happened after that actually moved it back. So after September, it's, uh, it's, it's vertical again. If you wait long enough, everything is fixed. Okay, we're supposed to talk also about bridges a little bit. In Chile, uh, again, no new lessons. We learned a bunch of uh, old lessons again. Skew bridges are very susceptible uh, to damage because of inadequate seat lengths uh, that occurs in, on the skew. Um, you know, liquefaction induced movements obviously have to be considered if you don't have any site remediation and the uh, many spans were unseated uh, due to this in uh, in Chile and in Christchurch they didn't have any collapses but they had a lot of issues with uh, with soil uh, movement uh, around the edges of bridges this picture is only for color here uh, you can't see much there but it does locate all the damaged buildings and what the strong ground motion was and where liquefaction was and you can conclude by looking at this that the performance overall in Christchurch of, of bridges was pretty good and most all the damage was due to lateral spreading at the uh, at the uh, on ramps to the bridges um, the older bridges displaced to the lateral spreading but there was actually no collapses there and the uh, Japan bridge industry is very sophisticated. Uh, they started with their first code in 1960 that was about 25 pages long. And uh, someone has now uh, charted the number of pages as sophistication to their bridge code. After Kobe, as you can see, there's a big jump from 100 to 250. And they're now at 275 and climbing. So clearly their bridge design is very sophisticated and uh, they performed as you would expect. They have a lot of seismic retrofits, just like we do in California, using all kinds of uh, wrapping of the piers, uh, new restrainers, they use seismic isolation of dampers. All of these systems performed uh, wonderfully. Uh, steel jacket, RNC, uh, reinforced concrete jacket, added viscous dampers, uh, post-95 restrainers, all these things were fine. But interesting, uh, here's an example to show that retrofit works and non-retrofit doesn't. Uh, they had a lot of problems with cutoff uh, bars at, at the middle of piers uh, in, in Kobe uh, time. And this particular uh, bridge had in fact restrainers put in, but for whatever reason they had not dealt with this issue of the cutoff and the mid height of the piers. And sure enough, there was damage there. This is temporary. Uh, jacketing to uh, stabilize that pier. The, the more modern bridges with the more pages in the code uh, all did wonderfully. Uh, there, was, there was really no damage in a, in a whole variety of, of steel and, and concrete bridges. So lastly we have the tsunami uh, of which there are some structural lessons. Uh, Again, uh, the 
the uh, what causes the tsunami you have heard of this before but this uh, plate here is being bent down and at some point it breaks loose uh, throwing us, us up uplift and here's the 50 meters that was previously des described and creating the wave now there's there's a lot of different uh, dimensions used in tsunami world there's something called the inundation depth uh, and also a run-up height and these two things get confused a little bit the run-up height is often bigger than the inundation depth because of valley effects or velocity effects so here is a is a uh, as only the Japanese could do they have incredible detailed data on on the inundation and run-up the red is the inundation so it typically would be smaller than the blue uh, which is the run-up and you can see in general we're talking about 30 and 40 meters here uh, so you the a five to six story building is in this area so you can see there was a lot of buildings that would have been overtopped uh, wood framing is, very, is almost impossible to design against uh, a tsunami, so if you have a wood framed area, it's basically going to get cleaned off. Um, engineered buildings, concrete buildings with a lot of walls can survive uh, structurally, um, and if they're tall enough, they can be vertical evacuation structures. Of course, they have to be tall enough, which in some cases didn't happen, as Lori will describe. Uh, steel buildings can also uh, work in this way, but they're lighter, so they have to be more robust to begin with. But of course, you have to realize if you have an EOC or something in a building like this, uh, nothing's going to be uh, saved in these inundated floors. So there's also a buoyancy thing, which we've seen before. This is a bridge that used to look like this. And you can see the piers and so on, and these are the various pieces that they ended up in this location. Uh, you, you have forces from the velocity of the tsunami which can push uh, a bridge section off like this and they found some of them upright like this which indicated this is what happened. But you also can have uh, a longer span with some buoyancy that both uplifts and has a force sideways and it will actually turn over and sure enough they found some of these sections also turned over. So both of these things happen. Um, you can put holes in your diaphragms to prevent this buoyancy effect and you can also tie down uh, the elements uh, for, against the force but if you tie it down then you have to design the piers of course for this lateral force uh, of, the, of the tsunami. Here's a steel building that clearly had a lateral force. It turned over and stayed uh, pretty well intact. You can see the foundation uh, pieces over here and right here you can actually see a pile <coughs> that has been pulled out of the ground and still attached uh, to the building. Just another indication that there is uplift. Here uh, the water rushes in these buildings. If they're tied down, the buoyancy forces, if their air is trapped, will, will push upward. This was also seen in Katrina in many buildings that had cavities. Uh, the biggest problem we try and design against tsunami is the impact uh, of de debris. Uh, in this case, there was a fire truck. The power poles go through the windows, or a power pole could float and hit endo on your column, producing a very large force. Or you could have a, a debris dam uh, that that uh, pushes causes a large horizontal uh, force. Um, they also found out that just like wind, the flow diversion and acceleration al around large buildings and down streets creates uh, additional uh, flow problems. Um, and that the, uh, to, to provide building survivability, you really need a certain amount of lateral strength and, and local element resistance to impact from whatever might be floating around. There is a subcommittee in ASCE 7 that is working on a chapter that will uh, put requirements for tsunami design into ASCE 7. Um, it's not totally clear whether the intention of this is to, for every building or for special buildings or for vertical evacuation. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but this is, people are working on this. There's also a FEMA publication, P4, P646, which is already on the street, which is for design of vertical evacuation structures. And that particular document um, is supposed to keep the building there for the earthquake and then keep it there 
and then have all the people rush there and go up on the roof, and then it will survive uh, the tsunami forces. <clears throat> the, the, the real problem, of course, as they found in Japan, you've got to have this high enough because if everybody rushes someplace and it's overtopped, uh, you know, you've probably done more harm than good. But FEMA is uh, trying to get some of these structures built as demonstration projects. Finally, policy and land use. This was a disaster control office building uh, that uh, people were in to, to after the earthquake and the tsunami came and uh, only 10 survived. I think Lori's going to talk about this a little bit as well. Here's a hospital that was actually retrofit for uh, seismic. You can see the braces, uh, but it was overtopped also in a tsunami and clearly cannot provide any functions. So what are some lessons that we've learned or confirmed? Well, older structures represent our largest vulnerability. The URMs are exceptionally damageable. Again, we've done a lot in California, but we probably have to think about how well we did. Certainly other states uh, have big problems in this area. Concrete buildings may be more deadly, in fact, and we have to start thinking about how we can <coughs> fix some of those. Newer structures generally perform well. Uh, however, there are some systematic failures in Chile that is causing us to uh, make some changes in ACI, for example. Um, some detailing rules, mainly. <coughs> the uh, isolated buildings perform very well. We have to look at the uh, uh, interfaces and make sure that, uh, that we won't have any short circuits. Unprotected non-structural systems are going to get damaged. There's no question about it if, if we don't take care of that. Bridges uh, seem to uh, perform as we expected. And in tsunami design, I think we learned a lot in terms of the structural engineering portions of it about how we might uh, design buildings to survive a tsunami, at least in the structural uh, frame. So I rushed a little bit there at the end, but we're a little bit behind schedule. So do we have any time for questions, Jay, or not? Yeah, I think yeah. questions. Yes. Uh, they, yeah, they are using uh, a surfacing of brick walls on some of their retrofits. They, they have done that, yes. And those buildings performed all right. I mean, they, uh, in plane was really not the problem over there. It was more out of plane, uh, the collapses of the walls. Anything else? Okay, thank you. We have